<laughs> oh, sorry. Zdrave. <laughs> it's the only phrase I know in Bulgarian, so if anybody wants to teach me any more phrases, I would love to learn <laughs> more phrases. Can everybody, so I know this podium's pretty high. Can everybody see me if I stand behind it? <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> so this, everybody, this is the PWA All the Things talk. If this is where you want to be, I'm very happy to have you. We will be discussing uh, creating PWAs and Angular, Vue, and React. So let's get started. So what we're going to cover today is we're going to talk a little bit about what PWAs are, why PWAs are, <laughs> and how to make a PWA. So we'll be creating it with Angular, with React, and with Vue. Sound good? Everybody like that? So uh, could I get a show of hands of how many people actually use Angular? OK, and how many people use React? And how many people use Vue? And then how many people didn't participate because they don't like raising their hand? No, no? <laughs> OK, so my name is Tara Manisic, and I am actually a developer advocate for progress. So I uh, went to school for computer science. I worked at um, Harvard University and got to go to their extension school for computer science. And while I was there, I learned about Women Who Code which is a really great organization that kind of helped me find a community while I was coding, because I wasn't a traditional student. And so in Cincinnati, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, I started and uh, direct the Cincinnati Women Who Code. And I became a developer advocate from first being a node engineer, and I was building a platform as a service, or helping build a platform as a service company. and. Uh, I learned about Node School through doing Node Engineering there, so I decided to found and uh, direct a Node School chapter in Cincinnati. And that's basically a, uh, a way for people to learn Node together through the terminal, in groups, and it's all open source projects. So this is all kind of just to give you my background and uh, let you know how my path kind of led me from learning CS to uh, using it and then learning to teach it and caring so much about the community that I wanted to do it full time. But most importantly, uh, I am the mother of this, the human mother of this bundle of weird right here. <laughs> so this is Tosh Magosh, and that is her adorable derp face. <laughs> so uh, you can find her on Instagram as well. And you can find me at, on Twitter at TZ Mannix. And this is the survey uh, link if you want to get grab a picture of that. It's, uh, I'll also put it on one of my last slides as well. So I want to first kind of talk about a bit about what progressive web apps are. Did uh, many of you attend the keynote yesterday on progressive web apps? Nice, okay. So I won't delve too much into it, but I'll give you uh, so a little bit mm, more than just kind of the high level that we looked at it yesterday. So there's a great book. It's one of the only uh, progressive web app books out there right now by Talatair. And he describes progressive web apps as, uh, you could read this, but he's basically saying something that Chris said yesterday, where we're taking advantage of modern technology. Just to be clear, this is not Talatair. It turns out this is like the creative director of Giphy. <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, so basically, this is... Uh, this is saying that we're using modern day technology in our applications, in our web applications, to create an experience for the user that feels more natural. We're taking advantage of the web to use it in a mobile instance and make the web much better. So we're going to dig into this a little bit and talk more about what each of those things mean. But I really wanted to, this is like the first session of the day, right? So I wanted to kind of do a little experiment. <laughs> so I hope that you are in a very um, open mood. I want to kind of <laughs> uh, energize you. So I decided, like, what better way to help you like, work as a community together, do something together, energize you, and give you different strategies to remember the things from this talk, but a uh, rap challenge. 
that's a record scratching. So what's going to happen is I am going to rap for you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, <laughs> but the, so each line is going to rhyme. And there's one word at the end that I want you all to say together with me. If you know what it is, think about what this talks about. So if you know what the last word is, as soon as you figure it out, just yell it out loud with everybody. So to kind of warm everybody up, is everybody ready? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, let's try this one more time again. Is everybody ready? All right, I'm going to make a fool out of myself. Let's go. All right. My name is Tara, and I'm here to say, to build the modern web, this is the way. Manifest and service workers are bay, and we'll help you build a... Yay! Good job. <laughs> that was great. I am so proud of all of you. That was so good. So the rest of the talk is just rapping. I'm just kidding, it's not. <laughs> but there will be more, so pay attention. So now back to the interesting things. <laughs> so to break down that quote uh, from Talatare, the latest web capabilities. When everybody thinks about this, we're talking about APIs. So we're talking about uh, all the APIs that are available to us on the web. And uh, there's the push API, but everybody always seems to talk about service workers. And I know a lot of times when people say service workers, it's like, oh, no. <laughs> because it seems like a lot. They do a lot. They do so much. It could be quite overwhelming. But there are some things I want you to keep in mind when you start digging into service workers. First of all, it's just JavaScript. So it's a JavaScript file that lives in between, separate from your app and the network if it's available. So. It's a JavaScript file that uses promises, and the very first line of it is an if statement. Like, how many people here have used if statements? Awesome. All two of you. No, I'm just kidding. So, so you know, it's something that you're familiar with. It's something that you can do. And again, it's just a JavaScript file. And you don't have to make a ton of service workers. You don't have to do push notifications. You don't have to cache every page. You can use it as you wish. You can just decide what you want to use, when you want to use it, and why. So also, this has to be served over HTTPS. Because what a service worker is doing is it hears a request come in. And whenever the requests come in for the network, it's interrupting a request. And it's manipulating these requests. So that sounds dangerous, right? Because it is dangerous. So that's why this can only be served over a secure network or local host. So if you're worried about what this may mean for security or how it may affect you, it has to be served over HTTPS. They've had this in mind. And also that implementation of it is progressive. So we talked a bit about this yesterday, how, or Chris did, how some browsers aren't supporting it just yet. So like WebKit, WebKit has it in development. And Edge has it in development, but behind a flag. But this just, but they're all working on it, right? So in a sense, you can kind of be taking advantage of uh, writing the things that will work for you know, the billions of users who are on other browsers that do support this. And once everybody else catches up, you can just sit back and relax and know that you have the code to make the web more accessible to your mobile users. So let's take a look at what a service worker looks like. Um, and this is just a high level, so you have an idea of how it looks. Um, and so, wow, that's so big. OK, um, so again, in the beginning, you just have that service worker. It's checking to see if it's supported, and also push manager. So it's saying, if it's supported, let's keep going. If not, we just let them know. And uh, the button that they have for the push notifications is changed font or changed text. So again, here, service workers work a lot with promises. So you see that you have the promise up top for register, um, the then, and the catch. So these are things that it's pretty easy to surmise what's going on in this file. It's pretty easy to understand this. So if you ever feel like it's quite daunting, just remember. 
It's just JavaScript. You can make it as scary as you want to. <laughs> so the next line in here, unique features of native mobile apps. So what the, the thought is for this is basically saying that we want the user to be able to work with the mobile they're used to on their phone. So work with the web as they're used to on their phone, or applications, that is. So one of the first things is push notifications. So this is where service workers uh, come in handy. So a lot of people use service workers to cache uh, information to serve it up faster, and then also for push notifications. So this is a way to re-engage your users and basically have, because your service worker is running separately of your application. So it's able to see when the, when the network is available, when things are coming through from the network, and it can send a push notification to your user, just like mobile applications. And one of the best things is you have offline functionality. Because I can't tell you how many times I'm on a website, and I know that I'm about to get on a plane, and I go, oh, I need to download this app because I need to keep using it. But if you have those offline functionalities via service worker on your web app, you give the user that advantage again of being able to continue their work, not interrupt their process at all, and work offline. And then to engage them even more and you know, keep them uh, using your application and aware of your application, you can now, with a manifest.json file, uh, add the ability to put an icon on their home screen on their phone. And the same with that manifest.json, it's one key value pair that lets you get rid of the Chrome, the um, internet Chrome, the browser Chrome on the phone to give you a full screen view of the application so that they can you know, feel really like they're just in the application, no distractions. So just like what they would feel as a, mode of a native app. So again, let's take a look at the manifest.json and see how not scary it is. So how many people here have written a JSON file? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so again, we're just doing um, whoopsie, key value pairs uh, here. And I just want to run down what each of these things are. So the first thing is uh, just the name. And the short name is what goes on underneath the icon on your home screen. So the biggest, most important thing about this is that it supports emojis. So I highly, highly um, say that you should, uh, that's Rob Lauer tweeting right now, is that notification? <laughs> um, so I highly recommend that you use emojis because it's so cool to just like see your icon on there with your emojis underneath. And, and then it's like anybody can read it no matter what language they read, right? And then underneath here is the icons, uh, the path to the icons that you use on the home screen. So where it gets interesting is down here on these bottom lines. That start URL is basically when they open it from their home screen. This is the metadata talking to the browser, telling, you, telling it how to display everything. And so if they have that home screen icon and they, you put a short URL in there, they will take them to that part every time they open from the home screen. If you leave that blank, it's wherever they installed your app to their home screen, it will always open there. It will default to that. And that display standalone, you can either do browser or standalone. And this is what gives you that full page view. This is what gets rid of that browser Chrome. And the background color is basically, uh, it's to help you kind of get the user to understand that something's still happening. Because when you open up that app, it is opening the browser. It is fetching the data, if it can, from the network or from the cache. So it will take some time. So if you set your background color, you're able to let the user know that something is happening. And then the theme color is basically uh, letting uh, like the search bars all be of a consistent color in your application. So if we move on to the next part of Talater's uh, quote on progressive web apps, the advantages of the web. So we talked about what's nice about being like a native mobile app. So what is nice about being on the web. My favorite part is that you don't need to install. So this is basically, you know, how many times that you have gone to the App Store and then you have to go through the process of downloading and 
then you realize you just don't want the application anymore. But more importantly, you have to think about your users who aren't, uh, you know, in a place that has good reception. They have 2G or they have, you know, a 3G, just not good reception, and they have to pay for data. So in the countries where you have to pay to load a card, to have data, to download things, it kind of gets costly for them. So we'll get rid of that and not have to install anymore. Um, and then also, you have the link to share. So what I always think about is when I have to guide my mother through different pages on a uh, native app on her phone, which is like, well, click the left button no, higher up on the, you know, that's, you got to go back. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my goodness. So if you just had a link that you could share to a certain place on the web application, it will open up them up there and not have to navigate through there. And also, Chrome now will prompt the user. It will engage the user for you. When they reach a certain criteria of visiting your site, that's a PWA, it will prompt them and see if they want to install it on their phone. You can, you can toggle that. But it's nice because it's basically the web working for you again. The other big thing about that is that you don't have to deal with app stores. So if you have to push something up, and make a small change because somebody spelled hassle wrong, then you just have to basically push your code back up. So there's no going through the store and resubmitting your application. You just have to push everything back up. So we are getting rid of hassle. Now, one of the big things that I like to concentrate on is not just the fact that progressive web apps are progressive in the way that there are no backward, you're not going to break anything when you do everything. There's also a progressive story as a user uses your application. So when they first come to your site, they are fine if they don't have reception. So there's none of that trying to do something odd, like submit an expense like Chris was saying yesterday, and then they lose service and the whole form is gone. Or it reloads because their network died. So you have, so it's then you have uh, that relief for your user to now have offline capabilities. And then once they have used that, they decide, I really liked that, so I will turn on push notifications. So now they get to re-engage with the user by sending these messages to them. And once they have that, they decide, OK, yeah, I'm going to install it on the home screen so I get full screen and I feel like I'm in the application again. And then they say, you know, I like this so much, I want to tell my friend, I want to share it. So how, you know, I just need to send the link to my friend, share it, they need to go to the link, and then they can install it. But then the developer realizes that there is a bug, and the user goes, oh, this bug is so annoying. And then they load it the next day, and they realize that a fix has been pushed, and they didn't have to install. They, so you have this happiness of your user to go through this progression of more and more advancements from their application to make them very happy. So these are all the, the kind of descriptions of what it is. But why? Why are we using PWAs? What, what are we looking for out of it? And this goes back again to being in, like you do not have to worry about the reliability of the network if you use service workers correctly, if you cache things, if you take into account what the user needs to do offline and give them the ability to do so. So you can rest assured no matter what or how bad the network is, your users can function, or can use your app. And it makes it go much faster now. Because if you are, so one of the strategies that people like to do is have everything that's like the skeleton of your application. So the navigation, the you know, welcome message, and they have that cached. So the first time around, you have to register a service worker. So things won't cache on the very first visit because you have to you know, let the web know what the service workers are working on, what file it's supposed to work on. So, but then you can cache all of that so it's going to load onto your user's phone immediately because it's coming right from their phone. So it's super, super fast. And then you have all that re-engagement. You have the browser asking them if they want to install it. You have it on their home screen. You have push notifications. So you're engaging the user even more. So in, in a sense, you're basically making the web better for your users. Because, I mean, does anybody here have a cell phone? 
Oh, oh, yeah? Okay. So, you know, how many people are using their cell phone or using their cell phone to, like, go on the web? So if we could have an opportunity to make the web better by adding a few files, making the web faster, you know, let's, let's do it. We're good, we're good developers. We're good people. <laughs> we want to do good things. So now let's dig into the code of how PWAs are made. And I just want to say all this code was written by Tosh Magosh. So if there are any errors, it's her fault. I'll let her know. Um, so if we look at the list again, we see that we covered these things. And first, we're going to talk about Angular. So Angular is what we're going to talk about now. Oh, wait a second. Is this another rap challenge? <laughs> OK, so to make sure everybody's ready for it, we're going to do the test again. OK, so are you ready? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank goodness. This one's really hard for me, but here we go. This framework has raised the bar. After switching from one to two, it went real far. At Google, this framework is the star. Let's build a PWA with <laughs> Yes, good job. <laughs> I wonder how that one would go. So I'm very proud of all of you. That was fantastic. <laughs> so yes, we will be building an Angular application. Um, and so what I want to do is kind of build a skeleton application with some Kendo UI components. And um, we just, we're going to build like a pretty robust one with Angular, because Angular is the framework that actually needs the most work done on it to make it a PWA. But you'll see that even saying that, we're basically adding two files and editing two files for PWA stuff. So we'll look into uh, creating the Angular application with the Angular CLI. So first, we install the Angular CLI with NPM, uh, I for install, dash G for global. And then we create a new project using ng new. And we're going to set the style to, um, to C to Seth and call it Progressive Angular. And then we're going to get started with um, Kendo themes. So I am using Kendo um, mostly because I work for them. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I, so I came from that back-end background. And like front-end UI, CSS was always so daunting to me. And I just like I didn't want to do it ever. And uh, what I really like about Kendo UI is that it puts all the components in there for you really easily. But also, they give you all the styling you need. So like you have to try really, really hard to mess it up, which I do sometimes. But they make it very hard for me to do so. So we're going to today work, uh, add the drop downs, uh, some buttons, and date inputs to make um, an application that you'll see it and you'll be like, yeah, you really can't design. Um, but it was fun to build anyway. Um, and another thing, so you see the dependencies here. And there are the uh, Kendo components. And one thing that's also really great about Kendo is these are native components. So they work seamlessly with Angular. So everything that you like about you know, um, ahead of time compilation and, service and uh, universal rendering, you don't have to change anything. You put these components in, you run your Angular like usual, and everything works well because it's just Angular. Um, so there are these other dependencies on the bottom here. And that's another thing that makes me like, really proud to use Kendo UI as well is uh, you have an internationalization library, but also all of the components have really great accessibility compliances. So it has um, section 508 compliance. I'm obviously reading from a list because these are long words. Um, and then you have uh, the web content accessibility, keyboard navigation, and um, ARIA support. So all of these things, like you don't have to worry about it at all. It comes with all of the components as you're, as you're putting these all in here. So we push all those in, and the first thing we have to do is include them in our Angular project. So this is inside source app, app.modules.ts, because Angular loves to nest everything. The first thing we do is um, we're just grabbing the components we want from this library. So we're getting the autocomplete module, the button module, and the date picker module. 
So we pull those in, we import those, and then we go through the list and actually put them inside of our ng module. And now we go inside our template. And this is where this screen is so awesome. It's like you can put the smallest code up here, and you can like everybody can see that, right? Oh, you can't. No? OK. So, um, so here, first, we are just basically putting these components in and passing parameters. And I'm going to put all this code up, so we'll kind of just run through this pretty quickly. Um, and then we add the date picker and a button. And so all of these were binding to events or to parameters so that uh, we can get this information in our page. And then inside here, we want more data. or We want to pass that data into the template. So we set a date, and we list some items, planets. I really wanted to put Pluto in there, but <sighs> so then the next thing um, I want to do is add the library for material. So this is uh, so we have like a, a beta version of material for Kendo UI right now, but um, I've used it thus far and have had no problems whatsoever. And it's just really nice to be able to um, not have to CSS much at all. And I was um, talking to PPK about this yesterday. When I style, when I say I'm going to style something, it basically means I'm going to add a Google font and change the background. <laughs> so that's what I did there. And so here is the import for the material design right there. So this is the beautiful site I made. <laughs> kind of ridiculous. But it's nice because I didn't have to do any kind of styling whatsoever for that date picker, or for any of the components, for that matter. And that's it on mobile. So it just, I didn't have to do anything. And I like when I don't have to do anything at all. So we have our base site. So how do we make it into a PWA? The first thing we want to look at is the index HTML, because we want to add that manifest.json. So right here is where we have a link to it. Because again, this is just metadata that we're passing to our browser. And if you get started with a progressive web app, I highly recommend that this be the first step you take, because it's the most gratifying of all of the steps. Because you, you basically add this in your index.html, and then you put your information in here. And I mean, you could even you know, just have one image and add the short name. And you get this awesome little icon on your phone. And you could put whatever you want on there. <laughs> it's really it's crazy to just be able to change one file, push it up. I use, uh, so like when I go to host it, so I just like hit refresh. And like from the CLI, I pushed it up and deployed it. And then I like went to my website and added it. And I was like, that, that would hap it happened so fast. So I highly recommend. If you get into PWAs, this is one of the first steps you take, because you'll feel so cool. So the next thing we have to do is add a service worker. And um, with Angular, um, they're one of the best ways to do it is actually use one of the libraries. So this is Workbox. And um, Workbox is basically a library that works with all kinds of build systems, well, NPM and, uh, and WebKit and uh, maybe Browserify, I think it is. And uh, you basically just go through a process. I, so I installed it um, globally so I could do it from any network and went through their CLI. And I'll go through the steps to do that here. So with your Angular application, you want to build it first and then have it generate the service worker, because this has to go in your files that are going to get deployed out. So, you want to make sure that you build first. And you can make this into an NPM script or put it in your build file. And you don't have to use Workbox from the CLI. You can use it as a JavaScript file. Um, but I, I, I live in, this, in the terminal, so I like it a lot. So the first step you take, you run this, and it uh, first wants you to set up kind of default. So the first thing it asks you is, uh, what's the root of your web app? And for Angular, it's your distributables folder, your dist folder. Um, and then you just walk through and tell it which files you want to cache. And uh, then it asks you what it wants to be named. And uh, most of the time, you'll see service worker files as sw.js. Um, and then they set up a config file, if you like, so that every time that you run generate um, colon sw, 
it knows all these answers for you automatically. So that's pretty nice. But again, we have to register that service worker. So we have to go back to our source index. That person is my height right now. <laughs> that's so cool. Um, so inside of your index.html, this is where we're adding the service worker that is or the JavaScript that is registering your service worker. So this is saying, you know, checking again to say that service worker exists so you don't break anything. And then it's, if you can, it looks for the load and registers your service worker. All right there. So real quick, I just want to, uh, I won't go into depths about this so that we can move on to the next framework, but Lighthouse is a really great tool and you can add it as a, um, as a Chrome extension. Uh, but you, this is also, you can have it as a JavaScript file. And I think you could, it's also a CLI tool you can use if you like. But Lighthouse is basically um, one of the Google tools that runs through their standards of, is this responsive? You know, how fast does it load? What's the first paint? And it gives you all the numbers. Chris talked about this in his talk a little more in depth yesterday. So we won't go into details about that. But one thing that I like about this is when you do it in your browser, it runs through everything that it's checking very fast, but it kind of lets you know what's going on, which is nice. So we want to move on to the next framework. Probably, you know, go to the next thing, see what that is. In a wrap. <laughs> I'm so predictable already. <laughs> OK, so, so we'll dive right into it then. OK, are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Do you already know what it is? <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. This library is Facebook backed and very well known. That's a fact. If you diss it to a fan, you might get smacked. Let's build a PWA with. Yeah. Yay. Good job. Oh, there's my air horn. <laughs> yes. Um, you all are really, really good at this. I'm, I'm feeling like we should have like a side session at the after party tonight where we just make more wraps. Just putting it out there. <laughs> okay, so we will be using React on this next one. And this is when we start to get into the really handy CLI tools. So both for React and Vue, we'll be using the CLI because they make it ridiculously easy. So this is actually going to go by pretty fast because they just make it that easy. So the first thing that I do is uh, install Create React App. Have, uh, have many of the React users out there used Create React App? Nice. So basically, this is another tool that helps you build a skeleton of the application. And um, to make the application, you just do Create React App. And then we're going to make a, just a very, very quick application. So one of the quickest things is doing, surprisingly, visualizations with React and Kendo UI. Um, this, is, this is new. And right now, we have wrappers for React. But um, coming very soon, we will have um, actual native React components instead of wrappers. But these wrappers are actually really easy to use. So it's fun to play around with. And we also want to um, install the Kendo UI library with that. Um, and then also the theme, so we don't have to do any styling. So what's really awesome about the Create React app is it comes default with your PWA files. So you have the manifest.json in your public directory, and then this register service worker.js. And also, if you use Preact, Preact has all of this as well. So Preact is PWA prepared. <laughs> so it's so nice. You have all of these tools right off the bat, and you don't even have to figure out where you're putting them, and they pre-populate them for you. So if we first get started, we can see in the index.html, it already has this manifest, and it links to it um, from its directory. And then we also want to add this bundle.js for the Kendo UI library. And then inside uh, source app.js, all we have to do is add the chart and the, the and the Kendo UI and the theme. And this one line will give us a chart. I was always like really amazed by this because I started, like I did some data visualization in college using D3. And that was a, a little while ago. So um, 
it was it was a very long process, very daunting process. I was like getting information from uh, GitHub and putting it into data visualizations. Um, that's relevant in a second. I'll show you why. But so all you need to do to add this is just a bar chart with some random data, and uh, then this is the manifest.json it comes with. And all I did was change a few things here to obviously put the emoji in there where it was needed, add some of the icons, and then um, you just need to add, just like uh, it has the icons there in the folder, you just need to add your image there. And the service worker it comes with is actually a really robust service worker. Um, it basically, like, and it walks you through, I really love that they put, um, I'm not usually a, big fan of, uh, of like this amount of comments, but they walk you, I really love this, they walk you through it really, really well and tell you everything that you need to know. So hence why it gets the biceps. So um, I didn't, this was such a simple app, I wanted to show you a much cooler one since I didn't have much time. So there's actually um, an application that it did everything I did for my school project, but way better. <laughs> And this is with the Kendo UI React uh, data visualizations. Um, I meant to put the link in there. I'll put the link on my slides. But uh, there's a lot of interactions that you can do with these charts, like taking out um, the value, like by clicking values and removing them from the visualization. And that just pretty much comes standards with the visualization. Like there's a huge API for the parameters you can change. So uh, that was like all of these things. The manifest.json that we had to, uh, you know, put together and build for Angular, and that service worker file that we had to use with Workbox, all just come with React. It's or with the Create React app and with Preact CLI tool as well. So that was all we needed to do. Like I said, this was going to go fast because is to get yourself set up on a PWA with React is super fast. So fast that we're completely done talking about React now. And it's time for another rap challenge. <laughs> All right, you're running out of possibilities. So if you don't get this, I'm really going to worry about you. But I have a lot of faith. So is everybody ready? Yeah. This is my favorite one. I hope I don't mess it up. OK. Now this library is on version 2. Built by a man named Evan Yu. You can use all the things, or just a few. Now let's build a PWA with you. Yay! <laughs> Good job. <laughs> so um, I'm a big fan of you. So I was extremely, extremely excited um, when they decided, the Kendo, de the Kendo UI decided to make wrappers for Vue as well. So um, this is, I, I really like this library. So we're going to be using the Vue CLI. And um, again, they make it super easy for you to create a PWA. So the first thing we'll do is uh, use npm i globally to install the Vue CLI. And then we just have to do um, Vue init PWA and the project name. So they have a whole bunch of different templates that you can use with the Vue CLI. And there's like a Webpack one. Uh, there's a simple one, which is really nice if you like a, just a very, um, you know, a very clean, not verbose application to kind of get yourself going and you add the things that you want. And they also have this PWA template. So the next thing I did was add Kendall UI. And then I decided that I would do a grid because everybody loves a grid. Um, so there we go. So the Vue CLI has a ton of awesome things for PWAs. They got really excited about PWAs and jumped on to do, um, to get a lot in, incorporated into their CLI tool. So in your static folder, you already have a manifest.json. And it even asks you questions when you are in the CLI preparing uh, your project. And it'll say, you know, ask you for the name of your project, if anybody has done like npm init to do their package.json file, it's the same thing with the Vue CLI, where it asks you these questions and then populates some files. So it will ask you what the short name of your application is, where you, again, can put emojis. And it will populate your manifest.json. And then in your build directory, you have 
service worker production and development. The production one um, is very robust, and we'll look at that next. But one of the really awesome things, I think, is the scripts that they have set up for the Vue CLI. This NPM run build does all of this stuff. But in the bottom here, it generates a service worker for your offline caching automatically. And actually, Create React app um, on the build will do that as well, um, which obviously you can customize to how you want it. But you can also not do anything at all, and it will cache your static resources, which is really nice. So this is what their service worker looks like. Um, and well, this isn't the full thing. I just wanted to show you again that this is another one where they have a bunch of comments for you that you can look through, figure out you know, how you want it to handle things, understand your service where it's like a little tutorial in a, in a JS file. And, um, understand it more, figure out what's going on, and figure out how you want to change it, how you want to utilize it, how you want to make it better for your application, whatever your use case is. The next file that we uh, are going to mess with is the source main.js. Uh, and the only thing we're going to do in here is add our Kendo uh, grid, grid components. So first we add the Kendo UI library. Then we add uh, the grid column and data source. Data source is how we're going to be binding data to the grid. And then we need the, to use the installers. And so we'll go here to use view.use view and put those in there. And then uh, finally put them inside of um, the components. So this is the template. And I was really worried. <laughs> I keep coming back to this. But I was worried about putting such small code up there. but it's so big. <laughs> OK, I'll get over that soon, I swear, because my talk's almost over. Uh, so in here, we're again just doing the components, putting in the data source to grab the data that we're just um, grabbing from a hosted uh, SVC file. And then inside the grid, I just set a few parameters um, to do cool things, like groupable and sortable, which it's crazy what the functionality does, and all you're writing is like a Boolean. It's really nice. And then you have your grid columns for the data that you want displayed. And this is the index.html. So it looks kind of crazy, but it's all just mostly metadata. So we have, uh, this is the default styling for uh, Kendo. So I just threw that in there under the title. And then the manifest.json the manifest is already has that link inside of the file for you. So you don't have to add any of that in there. That's already in there for you, as is the service worker loader. So this is a nice strategy of having, uh, there's a whole process for loading the service worker, and you just have to comment these out when you're ready to go to uh, production to get your service worker out there. And the grid is up there, and that's just what it looks like. I, that always amazes me that it looks so nice and I didn't do anything. I wish everything was like that. But alas, it's not. Um, OK, so then down here, inside of your dev tools, you have an application tab. And it's nice inside there. Um, right here, I'm just showing the manifest. But you see we already have uh, our emoji short name showing up. So the browser understands that all of that stuff is there. And um, there's another tab that you can look at your service worker and see if you have any errors, see if it's registering OK, if everything looks all right, if it's working. And there's also a button that you can click offline and reload your page to see how it reacts offline. So really simple testing, which makes it just super easy. So um, I want to also just point out the kendoui.com site. Uh, one thing that I'm, I think is really awesome is there's all the support for all four of these down here, jQuery, Angular, React, and Vue, all under the same license. So I switch libraries a lot. <laughs> and I know that sometimes on a team that can happen. But it's nice because with the one license, you can get support for all four of these in case, you know, who knows what happens. Not that, you know, frameworks are fickle in any way. But so you get, you know, everything that you get with, uh, with Kendo UI, like really great technical support who actually, you know, can uh, give you really good forums and resources with uh, the Kendo UI site. But check it out for yourself, kendoui.com. 
and this is the book that I was talking about earlier. This just got released uh, last month in October, and it's really great. Talater uh, basically goes through how we got to progressive web apps, like the journey of you know go going from mobile web, because like with web standards and like um, a lot of things that we we think should take off, we think are making the web better, you know, we go through a flux. But as with those things, like web components, you know, it's a way to make the web hopefully better. So I, th I think that's why we keep trying at it. And he does a great job talking you through that, but then he also walks you through step by step, creating your progressive web app, creating the service workers, doing push notifications. So it's a really great book. I highly recommend it. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, say thank you and that I will be posting my code and slides from my Twitter account. Um, but before I go, <laughs> we're going to do one last rap challenge. And I know that you're out of words, but I have, uh, I have a feeling you will know what this is. You're kind of like living it. And you know, okay, let's see. Okay. Is everybody ready? Yeah. The last one. Here we go. Thanks for being here and letting me teach. Enjoying Bulgaria really is a treat. A plus speakers, often topics they preach. So happy being with you all at. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Good job. So yes, yeah, thank you all very, very much. Thank you.